Anne Catherick, the woman in white. She was waiting for me by the lake, waiting to speak to me. She said she had a secret about Sir Percival which would destroy him if the world got to know of it. She would tell me the secret, and then he'd be afraid of me and wouldn't dare to treat me badly. In the past, she said, she's been afraid of him. But now, it seems, she's afraid no more. The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins Dramatised for radio in four parts by Martin Wade With Juliet Aubrey as Marion Halcombe Emily Bruni as Laura Fairley Toby Stevens as Walter Hartwright Jeremy Clyde as Sir Percival Philip Voss as Count Fosco and Edward Petherbridge as Frederick Fairley Episode 3 My heart, you see. It isn't right. And I haven't long to live, I'm certain. That's why I don't fear him. But before I die, I must try and make atonement. Atonement? What do you mean? I let you marry him. That was my sin. I should have stopped you when I was at Limeridge. But I became frightened and I fled so that he wouldn't take me back to the asylum. He can't harm me now, though. And if I tell you the secret and atone for my sin, I might meet your mother in the world beyond. Oh, if only I could be buried with her. If only I could wake up by her side when the trumpet sounds and the graves give up their dead. Well then, the secret. Yes. It was because of the secret that he put me in the asylum. My mother knows the secret too. I learned it from her. Tell me what it is. No. Not now. Why not? I think there's someone watching us. There's someone listening. But come here tomorrow. At the same time, alone. I will tell you it then. Did you try to speak further with her? Yes, Marianne, I tried, but she refused. She was determined to leave. Do you think she's telling the truth? Do you think there is indeed a secret that Sir Percival is afraid of? I do. I judge her words by Sir Percival's actions. And by his actions, it's clear he has something to hide. These journeys that he makes, they relate to Anne Catherick and her disappearance, I'm sure of it. He is determined to find her and prevent her from telling what she knows. Well, Laura, I must give you my news now. Mr. Gilmore has replied to your letter. He has. Here. You will see that he is highly suspicious of Sir Percival's conduct and is quite positive that you shouldn't sign a document whose contents are kept concealed from you. It should be sent to him first, he says, so that he may advise you. Good. Then I shall tell Sir Percival so. Well, Laura, as it transpires, Sir Percival won't be asking you to sign the document. He won't? Not for a while, at least. Why? What has happened? First of all, dear sister... I'm afraid that Count Fosco saw me when I received Mr. Gilmore's letter. Oh, Marion. He'd followed me without my knowing. And then Sir Percival arrived back and Count Fosco spoke with him in private. And shortly afterwards, the Count came to the drawing room and informed me that the business of the signature is put off. How very strange. He discovered that I had written to Mr. Gilmore. He guessed, I suppose, that the letter I'd received was a reply. I can only assume, therefore, that whatever conclusions the Count drew from this were enough to persuade Sir Percival to change his mind. Yes, but the question is, what are they planning now? Whatever it is, dearest Laura, the discovery of Sir Percival's secret will surely help our cause. You must keep the appointment with Anne Catherick tomorrow. Oh, I will. It is to be at the boathouse, she said, and at the same hour as today. Yes, that would be half past two, approximately. Very well. But this time, I'll come with you. She said I must be alone. No, I'll be nearby and I'll make sure I keep out of sight. But of course we mustn't leave the house together. That would inevitably arouse suspicion. Well, then I'll go first. I'll finish luncheon a little early and you will follow as soon as you safely can.
No one observed me as I went out of the house. I am sure of that. And there is no one, I think, in pursuit. I'll make towards the side of the boathouse so that Anne Catherick doesn't see me. No voices. Perhaps Laura's alone. Laura? Laura? Nobody here. Laura? Laura? Oh, please, God, let nothing have happened to her. Mrs. Mitchell, sir. Oh, Miss Halcombe. There you are. My sister, have you seen her? She went out for a walk. Yes, she came back a little while ago with Sir Percival. I'm afraid something distressing has occurred. What? Has she had an accident? No, but she was in tears, and Sir Percival has ordered Lady Glyde's maid to be dismissed. Dismissed, Mrs Mitchelson? Why? I don't know. And however much I prompted poor Fanny, she wouldn't tell me. She says she'll stay in the village in tonight and then go back to Cumberland. She has no friends here, she says. Where is Lady Glyde? In her bedroom, but you can't see her. Why ever not? The door's been locked. Sir Percival's orders... I found Sir Percival in the library, along with the Count and Madame Fosco. They fell silent as I entered. Am I to understand, Sir Percival, that my sister is being kept under lock and key? Yes, that is exactly what you are to understand. And perhaps you should take care, Miss Halcombe, that the same treatment isn't meted out to you. What? Percival! How dare you? How dare you threaten me? How dare you treat your wife in this fashion? There are laws in England, you know, to protect women from cruelty and outrage. If you hurt but a hair of Laura's head, if you try to interfere with my freedom, I will have recourse to those laws, I assure you. You see, Fosca? You see? <laughs> what have you got to say now? I say what I said before. This is wrong. It is very wrong. And I say this, Sir Percival. If such conduct continues, I will no longer be able to take advantage of your hospitality. I'll not remain in a house where ladies are treated in this despicable way. Oh, will you not? Well spoken, my angel. Sublimely spoken. Mm, thank you. As a rule, Percival, my opinion directs and leads Madame Fosco's. But today, you see, the roles have been reversed. My angel, I'm at your service. If you wish us to leave this house, then leave we shall. So, Percival, what now? What do you say to that? Have it your own way. Have it your own way, damn you, and see what comes of it. Oh, before you go, yes. the key to Lady Glyde's room, if you will be so kind. The Count, once he had received the key, handed it to me with great ceremony, and I hurried up to Laura's room. Laura, it's Marion. Marion, here is... Oh, oh, how glad I am to see you. You persuaded Sir Percival? No, I'm afraid it is due to the Count that I am here, and to your aunt. Now, Laura, you must tell me everything. Did you meet with Anne Catherick? What happened? Why did Sir Percival lock you in here? I shall tell you, I promise, but first you must tell me. Has Sir Percival relented? Am I still a prisoner? He has given way. You are, as the Count declared, mistress once more in your own house. Oh. You know, Laura, I am becoming ever more wary of Count Fosco. His influence over Sir Percival seems to grow greater by the day. Please, don't talk of the Count. I hate him, Marion. Mm. I detest him. He is the vilest creature on earth. Laura, Laura. He is a spy, an Laura, informer. Shh, shh. There's someone outside. Yes, it is I. Oh, Miss Halcombe. You dropped your handkerchief when you were downstairs. And I thought I would bring it to you as I was on my way to my room. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Madam Fosco. Laura, she heard everything you said. Yes, well, what I said is true. I do detest the Count, and he is a spy. He's been spying on you, Marion, and he was spying on me and Aunt Catherick yesterday. He overheard a part of what she said to me. He knew that I was to meet her today, and he advised Sir Percival as much. Where is the note, Laura? Sir Percival has it. Sir Percival? He was waiting for me. Oh. I just had time to read it, and then he suddenly appeared and took it from me. Oh, Laura! He demanded to know what Anne Catherick said to me yesterday, every word, from first to last. And? Did you tell him? I was alone with him, Marion. He was gripping my arm so tightly. He was beside himself. He was like a madman. You told him everything? Yes. 
But he's certain I know more, and he swore he'd force the truth out of me. He thinks I've discovered his secret and told it to you. He's afraid that Fanny might learn of it also. That's why he's dismissed her, I suppose. Laura, I think we are in great danger. Yes. But what are we to do? I must write to your uncle. Tell him something of what has happened. Of the way Sir Percival has treated you. Oh, but the disgrace of it. No, the disgrace will be Sir Percival's, not yours. And the threat of disgrace may help to bring him to his senses. Or he may be driven to desperation and make things a hundred times worse for us. Well, perhaps it is a risk we must take. I will ask your uncle if you might... if we might stay at Limeridge House for a while. He is a selfish, indolent man, I know, but he might grant the request in order to achieve some peace and quiet hereafter. But what if the letter is intercepted? It won't be. I'll make sure of that. Mrs. Mitchelson said that Fanny was staying at the village inn tonight before starting for Cumberland tomorrow. Yes. Oh, poor Fanny. Well, she is a girl who can be trusted, I know. I'll give her the letter, and she can deliver it herself. First, though, I have an unwelcome but pressing appointment. I must speak with the Count, though it will sicken me to do it, and apologise for what his dear wife overheard just now. I am afraid of him, Laura, and he must be appeased. Let me assure you, Miss Halcombe, I keep no secrets from my husband. None, Miss Halcombe. When he noticed that I was distressed, it was my painful duty to tell him why. I feared as much. Count Fosco, let me earnestly entreat you. Miss Halcombe, there is no need... Lady Glyde spoke rashly and thoughtlessly. She did me an injustice which I lament, but I am unresentful. I forgive her. Let us all this instant dismiss the matter from our minds. Thank you. You are very kind. Thank you so much. My dearest Miss Halcombe, the pleasure is mine entirely. Give me your hand. Count. Yes, my angel? Miss Halcombe, being an Englishwoman may not be accustomed to such demonstrations of civility. My angel, you are right. Miss Halcombe, my apologies. My sweetest wife, I will take your hand, if I may. I was sickened by the feel of the Count's fat fingers and the touch of his poisonous lips. And if Madame Fosco's tigerish jealousy had not come to my rescue, I cannot say if I would have maintained my degrading self-control. I hurried back to my room and sat down at the table to compose the letter to my uncle. And as I did so, I had the feeling that my writing things were not as I had left them in the morning, but were perhaps a little too tidily arranged. In future, I decided I would take no risks. I would always lock my door. Well, I have been to the inn and the letter is safe in Fanny's hands or rather in the bosom of her dress, and there it shall stay, she says, until she delivers it. Do you mean to join us at dinner? No, not for the world. Laura, has anything happened? Sir Percival was at the door, hardly five minutes ago, demanding to be told where Anne Catherick is. He's certain, I know. Well, he hasn't found her yet, and one must be thankful for that, not just for her sake, but also for ours. While his efforts are directed towards finding Anne Catherick, he may not be quite so active in his persecution of us. I was exhausted by the heat of the day and by the trials and anxieties I had endured. I decided that before dinner I would go to my room and rest. Within minutes of lying down upon a sofa, I fell asleep, and in a dream a face appeared. A man's face. Listen. Listen. Walter Hartwright! The wide ocean separates us. But I shall return, I promise, and give what help is in my power. That night when I met the woman on the high road, the woman in white, that night I dedicated my life to a purpose as yet unseen. I shall return. I shall visit the tomb of white marble, and I shall read upon the cross a newly cut inscription. 
And as I kneel by the cross, the shadow of a veiled woman shall rise up from the grave beneath, and the three of us shall be together once more. Till then, have courage and be resolute. I shall return. I awoke trembling. I'd never dreamt such a vivid dream before. I prepared for dinner and went downstairs. Within a few hours, I would need all the courage and resolution I could muster. The English, Miss Halcombe, they love to praise their oratorios, and the Germans, they praise their symphonies. Fosco. And together they pour scorn on us Italians, because, they say, we have failed to produce these higher forms of music. Fosco. My response I... is this. They forget Rossini. Mm. Rossini the immortal. Rossini the phenomenal. Uh, Fosco, I must talk with you. Well then, talk. No, I meant in private. Ah, then it must be later. I'll not abandon the ladies. It is close, is it not? It is indeed, Madame Fosco. Ah, but we will gain relief, ladies, and very soon. The weather will break, I promise you. There'll be rain tonight. I wonder, Miss Halcombe, was it you whom I saw a little earlier, taking a walk in the direction of the village? The village? No, I think not. Oh, perhaps it was Lady Glyde. I might have a walk myself, before it rains, you know. Madam Fosco, good evening to you, my dear. No, 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 please, sit down. What an unfortunate business it is, you having to leave us, and so suddenly. Yes, your ladyship, it is. My reason for coming here, Fanny, my dear, is that I have one or two messages which Miss Halcombe forgot to give you. Oh, but... Yes, Fanny? Miss Halcombe has already given me a message. Has she? For Mr Fairley. A very important message. Well... These are additional messages, my dear. But before anything else, why don't you and I have a cup of tea? The Count was right, I think. A change in the weather. Oh, my head still aches. I ought to go to bed. I've been trying to write my diary, but my thoughts have wandered and have never reached the page. Outside, darkness. No moon, no stars. The rain will come, but not yet. <laughs> Tobacco smoke. Someone must be on the lawn. Oh, yes, I can see a red spark. Ah, and here comes another. This one slightly larger. The first was a cigarette, the second a cigar. What's the matter? Why don't you come in and sit down? I'm waiting for Miss Halcombe to go to bed. See, up there, the light's still on in her room. Oh, but why must you wait? Well, dear Percival, Miss Halcombe is a clever woman, and a distrustful one, and a bold one, too. She mustn't have the chance to overhear us. For heaven's sake, we shall be in the library. We shall sit at the far end of it, if you like, away from the door. We shall not be overheard. Uh, nevertheless, I shall wait. You go in, if you wish. I'll join you. Oh. Very well. Patience, Percival. You must have patience. Well, what if I could overhear them? Sir Percival clearly thinks the matter for discussion is a pressing one, and the Count regards it as important enough to warrant taking precautions. It ought to help our cause, therefore, to discover what they have to say. How to do it, though? To go downstairs, to listen at the door, that would be a great risk and would probably be fruitless. Oh, but the veranda, perhaps. Yes. Its roof is just a few feet below me. If I could lower myself down and creep along, I'm sure I could get as far as the library window. Yes. I'll do it. For the sake of Laura's happiness and her honour. Perhaps even for the sake of her life itself and mine. Now, Count Fosco, I shall blow out the candle and you shall go back indoors. And then, let the adventure begin. There now. Slowly, carefully, keep close to the wall. <gasps> keep very close. A flat pot crashing to the ground won't greatly help your plan. Slowly, 
carefully. There's a light in that window. Madame Fosco's room. The blind is pulled down, thank heavens, and there's her shadow on it. Do I wait till she has gone to bed, or, or do I move on very quietly? Very quietly. Move on. Will you have a brandy? Thank you, Percival, but no. Oh, sucre, nothing more. Sugar and water for a grown man? You can mix it yourself. Very well. So, yes, we must take action. Yes, and we must take it soon. We are at a crisis, Percival. My crisis, perhaps, is a little less critical than yours, being a matter of some hundreds of pounds, in contrast to the thousands you are owing. Uh, those hundreds, Fosco, you owe to me. Indeed, we both need money. My wife's money. Yes, but how to obtain it? Are we to use threats and brute force, as the lower orders prefer? Or may we not find, as men of education and refinement, that quiet determination is the better way? Bear in mind, Percival, we are dealing not merely with your wife, but with her sister, too, who is sharp-witted, strong-minded, an altogether unusual example of her sex. A fine, glorious creature. I drink her health in my sugar and water. Do so. Damn the woman, I say. Damn the pair of them. Ah, <laughs> you see? You've allowed them to provoke you. And that is why you have failed. From now on, therefore, you should leave the whole business to me. Tell me, Percival. How much do you hope to get from your wife? Mm. Three thousand a year, once her uncle has died. Mm. Is the uncle old? Uh, no. Is he ill? No, he pretends to be. And the three thousand a year is all that you can expect? Yeah, that's right. Unless she dies, of course. Uh, yes, of, of course. At last. At last. It's starting to rain. Unless she dies. Oh, God. If she were to die, what then? Well, assuming there were no children. Is it likely that there will be? No, Fosco. <laughs> it is not likely at all. <laughs> then you would get how much? Twenty thousand pounds. Twenty thousand? Good. Madame Fosco has gone to her window. She's pulling the blind up. She's looking at the rain, I suppose. There she is. Oh, don't turn this way, Madame Fosco, please. Oh, she's dropped the blind. Thank heavens. So, if you want money soon, if you want to make certain... No, Fosco, no. We shall not even talk of it. My dear friend, I'm simply stating the position. If you are to win the 20,000, and let us not be coy, if my beloved wife is to inherit too... Then your wife, sadly, must die. It's very simple. Simple it may be, but I'll not have it, Fosco. I'm being practical, that's all. Business-like. You and I need money. Your wife has the money we need. You've tried to get at it, but she has refused to sign that document of yours. And so? He means it. He does. If it's left to him, he'll have Laura killed. Then, of course, there is a second difficulty. And this second difficulty seems to have got itself mixed up with our little financial embarrassments. But it is your difficulty, Percival, and yours alone. And it has altered you for the worse. The name of the difficulty, I understand, is Anne Catherick. I could draw your secret out of you if I wanted. I could, believe me. But if you wish me to respect your privacy, then I will. I have consummate self-control, Percival. I'll not pry into this difficulty of yours. But I am nonetheless willing to help you out of it. Would you like me to help? Oh, yes, Fosco. Yes, yes, I would. It's more serious than the money, you know. Anne Catherick must be found. And if she isn't, there's no hope for me. Why? Because she knows your secret too? Yes. And because she knows it, you had to put in an asylum? Yes. She isn't mad, I take it. She's mad enough to be locked away. Just. And sane enough to ruin you when she's at large. Precisely. Who else knows the secret? Anne Catherick's mother. She told it to Anne. What about Lady Glyde? Well, in the note that I found, Anne Catherick wrote that she and my wife would talk about the secret again. So it's clear that my wife has knowledge of it. Also, 
There's a man named Hartwright, a drawing master. He knows something too, perhaps. He and my wife... Yes? Well, they are, they, they, they were, in love. Ah, indeed. Where is this Hartwright now? He is out of the country. And what about Anne Catherick's mother? Is she to be trusted? She is. She told your secret once? Yes, but she won't repeat her mistake. She has some interest in the matter, does she? It, she does. If I'm to search for Anne Catherick, I must know how to recognise her. I saw her from a distance only when she was at the boathouse. Oh, it's very easy to describe her. She bears a remarkable resemblance to Lady Glyde. Really? Imagine my wife after a severe illness, and you have Anne Catherick. Good heavens. And they're not related? Not at all. <laughs> well. <laughs> well, well, well. Why are you laughing? Oh, a rather fanciful little thought has just struck me. You'll like it, I think. Tell me. Oh, no, no. We've talked enough tonight. Time for sleep, Percival. The sleep of the just. And when daylight comes, let us see what the magnanimous Fosco will do for his dear, dear friend. They said no more. They said all that I needed to know. More than I needed. I dragged myself back across the veranda roof, entered my room and sank down upon the floor. I was drenched. I was frozen to the bones. And my heart was chilled by all that I had heard. After a while, I can't say how long it was, I roused myself and changed into dry clothes. And now a throbbing heat has replaced the cold. Was it four that struck? Or five? I, I should lie down and rest, but, but, but if I do, I may lack the strength to get up again. Uh, burning. Skin's parched. And I'm so very frightened. Please, God, help me. Tell me, Mrs. Mitchelson, how is the patient? Still in a fever, sir. Did you give her the mixture I made up? I tried, sir, but she refused. Sir Percival has sent for the doctor, of course. Well, let us hope that he's a man of competence. Mr. Dawson? Oh, yes, certainly he is. Well, you may think so, Mrs. Mitchelson, but forgive me. You're not fit to judge. Mm -hmm. Lady Clyde, I suppose, is greatly distressed. She is, sir, she is. She was out in the rain, sir. Miss Halcombe, I mean. Last night? Last night, sir. That's what has started her illness, I'm certain. The maid found a pile of clothes in Miss Halcombe's room. Soaked through, they were. That's strange. That's very strange. From the bottom of my heart, oh, magnificent Marion, I breathe my wishes for your recovery. Here is her table, and here is her diary. Let me read what she has written since last I looked. Mr. Fairley? I am he. You, I am given to understand, are called Fanny, and you are Lady Glyde's maid. I was, sir, uh, till yesterday. Something is creaking. Creaking, Mr. Fairley? Yes. Very loudly. Please make it stop. Well? I have a letter for you, sir. From whom? Lady Glyde? No, sir, from Miss Halcombe. Put it on the table and don't knock anything over. It Seems to be a very crumpled letter. Yes, sir. I noticed that, sir, when I came to after fainting. Fainting? Yes, sir. At the inn. The inn? Which inn? At Blackwater. Madame Fosco was... What? Madame Fosco was at this inn, was she? Yes, sir. She came there, she said, because there were some other messages I had to take, as well as Miss Alcombe's letter. But I never received them, because Madame Fosco told me I must have tea with her. That was uncharacteristically kind of my sister. And then, you see, sir... 
I fainted. Uh, pray, why did you do that? I don't know, sir. I've never fainted before in my life. And then when I came to, Madame Fosco left. I think it may be the stays, sir. The stays? Yes, sir. They caused the fainting? No, sir. They're making the creaking noise. I have read Marion Halcombe's diary. I have written in it, too. Just a few words of sincere homage and admiration. But now, I return the diary to the writer's table. Events are hurrying me away. Serious issues await me. Vast perspectives of success unroll themselves before my eyes. I, Fosco, must embark upon an extraordinary enterprise. Well? Ah, Percival, have you found Anne Catherick? What a pleasant day it is. Uh, tell me. I'll tell you, Percival. But this, I think, is not the time. Good morning, Mrs. Michelson. Good morning. How is the sufferer? Miss Halcombe is a little better, I'm glad to say. I'll be in the library, Fosco. Don't be long. The fever came and went, sir, during the night, and now it seems she is improving. Mr. Dawson is with her at the moment. Ah, uh, yes, Mr. Dawson. And so is Lady Glyde, of course. She won't leave her sister for a minute. Oh, she does cry so, and is so very anxious and fearful. Well, Mrs. Mitchelson, there is help at hand. Okay. For Lady Glyde, for my wife, who has done her share of the nursing duties, and indeed for you. Uh. I've sent for a woman of excellent conduct and capacity, who is known to my wife as a person to be trusted. Uh. Don't tell Mr. Dawson. He will, I'm sure, look with a prejudiced eye on anything that I provide. Ah, here is the good doctor himself. What news, Mr. Dawson? Can it be true there is improvement? It is true, though the illness is still a cause for great concern. I suppose, because you think Miss Halcombe is making progress, that you will persist in the saline treatment that you are giving her? Certainly I will, since it's justified by my professional experience and by its effect upon the patient. Uh, um, might I offer some advice? Why should you? Are you a doctor? I have studied medicine. Perhaps you have. But it's not my habit to consult with amateurs. <laughs> well, let me make an inquiry then. I wonder, as you are a little way removed from the centres of scientific research, whether you've heard of the use of ammonia and quinine in the treatment of debilitation. Also of the palpable benefits of mesmerism. And if you Sir, have... please, no more. If you were a trained and practised physician, sir, I would gladly discuss such matters with you. But you are not. Therefore, goodbye. <laughs> Mrs. Mitchell, sir. Yes, Mr. Dawson. I shall return this evening. In the meantime, there are to be no alterations to my course of treatment. Is that clear? <laughs> I obeyed Mr. Dawson, of course. Being nearly the housekeeper, I was obliged to do so. But I must confess... The Count spoke with such conviction concerning the appropriate treatment for Miss Halcombe that I began to have more trust in him than in Mr. Dawson. And it was clear to me that the patient was slow in making progress. Well, Mrs. Mitchelson? She had an indifferent night, I'm afraid. Oh, I'm sorry to hear it. B before you go up to see her, Mr. Dawson, yes. I should warn you, there is a nurse with her. A nurse? Who arranged this? The fat foreigner, I suppose. Mr. Dawson, really? The man to whom I suppose you are referring is a nobleman, a member of the highest aristocracy. Yes, and he wouldn't be the first quack with a handle to his name. He's a charlatan. Oh. He's an infernal meddler, too. He should have spoken with me first. He should have sought my permission. Where is he? Oh, Count Fosco's not in the house. He's gone away. Oh, for good? No, no. Just for a few days, mm. I think. On business... The nurse is perfectly competent, Mr. Dawson. Mm. Truly, she is. Mr. Dawson, please, come in. Thank you, Lady Glyde. Good morning to you. Ah. I see Miss Halcombe is asleep. Yes, though it is fitful sleep at best. Oh, I'm so worried about her. Of course you are. 
But your sister will make a full recovery. She will, provided that my instructions and mine only are carried out. What is the name of the nurse? Mrs. Rubel. Good morning, Mrs. Rubel. Good morning. Pleased to meet you. I wish you weren't here. I don't think I want to trust her. Well, Lady Glyde, I won't seek her dismissal yet. But I assure you, if I have reason to complain of her, she'll go at once. Tell me, Mrs. Rubel, have you been seated over there since you arrived? Yes. Can you perform your duties well, do you suppose, while you are sat at the window? Miss Halcombe has been asleep all this while. She does not yet know me. If I were to sit at her side, I might alarm her when she wakes. Yeah, true enough. You might. Mr Dawson, forgive me, I'm reluctant to say this to you. Not least because it was suggested to me by Count Fosco. Oh, him again. But if Marion should get worse, or if after many more days there should be no change for the better... Yes, Lady Glyde? Would you permit me to send for advice from London? Of course. Indeed, I hope that before you think it necessary, I will have taken such a step myself. It will be a sensible precaution. And it will also, I trust, give me the pleasure of exposing Count Fosco as either a fool or a fraud. Five days of undisturbed tranquillity, that is all. Five days in which to attempt to recover from the uncivilised intrusion of the young person who is Laura's maid, or, or was. And then, on the sixth day, I'm to be visited again by the husband of my tiresome sister. Oh. Mr. Fairley? Uh, Count Fosco. What a delightful house this is. And what a veritable treasure trove is contained within this room. Shall I be seated? Uh, please, but quietly, if you can. I see that you're in some distress. I'm always in some distress. I'm nothing but a bundle of nerves. Less than a week ago, I must tell you, I was put upon by a young person in service who had a bizarre tale to tell and a crumpled letter from Marion, Miss Halcombe. Ah, indeed. Miss Halcombe. It seems that Laura, Lady Glyde, has had a falling out with Sir Percival, and Marion, therefore, was demanding that I open Limeridge House as a refuge for her. Yes, I am aware of this. I have to say, I was not pleased by the letter. I think it is very unfortunate and very unfair that having shown myself to be too considerate and self-denying to add a family of my own to an already overcrowded population, I should be made to suffer for other people's marital mishaps. Mr. Fairley... If I do have Laura back, is Sir Percival not likely to follow her here? <laughs> and is he not likely to demonstrate a violent resentment toward me for harbouring his wife? No, not at all. Mr. Fairley... I have written to Marion. I have asked her to come here alone and talk the matter over with me. If nothing else, the strategy will grant me some breathing space. Miss Halcombe has not replied to your letter. I'm glad to say she has not. The reason she has not replied is that events at Blackwater Park have taken a melancholy turn. Oh, have they? I... Must I hear about them now? Won't they keep? Sadly, no. Is anybody dead? Dead? No, heavens, no. Oh, so glad. Uh, forgive me, but I always like to anticipate the worst. It breaks the blow by meeting it halfway. Is anybody ill? Yes. Miss Halcombe. Is it serious? Yes. A fever. A fever? Is it infectious? Not at present. Not at present? <laughs> Mr. Fairley, I am here, as it were, as Miss Halcombe's proxy. Since she is not well enough to plead her sister's case, I must plead it for her. Oh, must you? She is right. Lady Glyde cannot remain under her husband's roof. You must receive her here, and very soon. You need not be anxious about Sir Percival. I know him. I am his oldest friend. He'll not pursue her here. You have my word on it. So, write to Lady Glyde, if you will. Do your affectionate and honourable duty and invite her to Limeridge House. Do it now. Now? Yes, so that I can take the letter back with me. She won't come, you know. Not while her sister is ill. She will come. She must. Not only do relations with Sir Percival deteriorate day by day, but Lady Glyde's health and spirits suffer too, because of the marriage, because of her anxiety over Miss Halcombe. Oh. As for travelling arrangements, there is no difficulty there. 
I have recently taken a house in London, in St. John's Wood. Lady Glyde can be met at Waterloo Station, and she can stay with myself and your dear sister, and can continue the journey the following day. Nothing could be simpler or more convenient. Now, the letter. Oh. You have writing materials here, I see. Oh. Uh, do mention the overnight stay in London. It will help to convince her. Mm. Mm. Sir, I must protest. You ought not to have come into the room. But I had no choice, Mr. Dawson. The housekeeper has informed me that Miss Halcombe's condition has greatly deteriorated. So I'm here in the interests of sacred humanity. Excuse me. When did the change occur? Late last night. You should have called a physician from London. I have already done so, and when he arrives I will consult with him, sir, but with no one else. Ah, she begins to wake. Yes, my dear Miss Halcombe, it is I. You need have no fear. Go away, please. Go away. Leave her this instant, sir. Can't you see she's terrified of you? Well, Mr. Dawson, it is not to be wondered at. Irrational fears, hallucinations, these are to be expected in one who has contracted typhus fever. Typhus? No. No, it's not typhus. You're quite mistaken. I assure you, Mr. Dawson, there is no possibility of error. It is typhus fever. And your treatment, sir, is responsible for bringing it on. The Count was proved to be correct, as I thought he would. The physician came from London and confirmed the Count's diagnosis. But he gave us some small cause for hope. We waited. I prayed, as did Lady Glyde, who was very brave. And after five days, merciful providence saw to it that Miss Halcombe's condition improved. The London physician visited again and declared that the patient was out of danger. Ah, Mrs Mitchelson, come in. I've just heard, sir, that Mr Dawson will not be returning here. Uh, that is correct. He's had something of a falling out with Count Fosco, and his pride, I suppose, has taken a bit of a knock, too. Yes, but, Sir Percival... I do worry that there is no local doctor to attend on Miss Halcombe. No, no, it's not necessary. The man from London said so. She might suffer a relapse, though, and, and there is Lady Glyde to consider, too. Ah, Lady Glyde. Her sister's illness has greatly affected her. I almost feel that there should be as much concern for her as for Miss Halcombe. Well, Mrs. Rubell is still here, and she's proved herself to be more than capable. No, no, your fears, I think, are quite unfounded, and I would ask you, therefore, to give your full attention to a rather more pressing matter. Mrs. Mitchelson, I find that Blackwater Park is something of a drain upon resources at present and that serious economies have to be made. I want you, in consequence, to dismiss the domestic staff. Uh, dismiss them, sir? All of them? With the exception of Mrs. Rebell, of course, and your good self. But the rest of the staff must go. I want this house cleared of the whole lazy, useless pack. When must they go, sir? By this time tomorrow. Tomorrow? But, sir... I... Mrs. Mitchelson, there's no need for them, and therefore they must go. Uh... Is that understood? The staff were dismissed, and the house became a strange, quiet, lonely place. It was surely not unnatural that my spirit should sink, or indeed that I should be uneasy about the way events were unfolding. I became still more so when Sir Percival declared that Lady Glyde and her sister, once they were well enough to make the journey, might benefit from a few days in the genial climate offered by Torquay. He instructed me to go there straight away and reconnoitre for a suitable place of residence. But I had a suspicion that I was being sent quite deliberately on an unnecessary errand. Come in, Mrs Mitchelson. Thank you. Oh, your ladyship has gained in health, I think, while I was away. I think I have. And what of Miss Halcombe? Yesterday she was no worse, but I've heard no news of her at all today. Perhaps you and I should go to her room. Uh, yes, please. We'll, we'll do that. The Count and Madame Fosco left yesterday, you know. Did they? I had no idea it would be so soon. Uh, ladies... Sir Percival. Uh, may I ask where you're going? T to Marion's room. Well then, let me spare you a disappointment. She's not there. Not there? She left yesterday morning with your aunt and Fosco. 
and Mrs. Robell too. She's going to Limeridge House, you see, and thought that since the Count and his wife were travelling to London, she'd go with them. It's impossible. She wasn't fit to travel. Mr. Dawson had been here. Uh, but Mr. Dawson was not here. Mr. Dawson has decided to have nothing more to do with this. Why should Marion want to go to Limeridge? Because your uncle won't receive you until he has seen your sister first. He stated as much in the letter he wrote to her at the start of her illness. It was shown to you. Do you not remember? Yes, I remember. She has never left me before. Not without telling me. But she knew that if she did tell you, then you would try to stop her. You're very anxious. Absurdly so. I'm anxious for my sister. Well, there's no need to be. She's left for Limeridge to speak to your uncle. What's strange about that? You must forgive me, but I am not satisfied. I wish to take the first train that I can and follow her. Your ladyship. If my sister was deemed fit to travel, then I am too. I intend to leave here. Very well. I'll not oppose you, but you must go tomorrow. Not today. I'll write to Fosco by this evening's post. Why? To tell him to expect you. He'll meet you at the station and you can stay overnight in St John's Wood. No, please. That's not necessary. Of course it is. You mustn't attempt the whole journey in one day. You must rest in London and I won't permit you to be on your own in some hotel. And nor would your uncle. My uncle? I have a letter from him, which you will read when you come downstairs. Fosco offered to have you stay for the night, whenever you should make the journey, and your uncle strongly endorses the idea. The arrangement is eminently sensible and appropriate. Do you not think so, Mrs. Mitchelson? I confess I can see no objection to it. Nevertheless, don't write to the Count. Please. Oh, but I shall write to him, and there will be no more argument, unless you prefer not to go at all. The train doesn't leave for half an hour. You have plenty of time. Yes. Please assure me, my lady, that you are going of your own free will. Well, yes, I am. No one compels me, but go I must. I am so fearful for my sister. Ah, here is Sir Percival. You needn't have troubled to wait. Get in, please. So this is our parting. It may well be that I will see you no more. Will you try to forgive me as sincerely as I forgive you? Driver. Goodbye. Goodbye, Sir Percival. Goodbye. Lady Clive. Oh, Count Fosco. How good to see you. Sir Percival's letter reached me just in time. You had a pleasant journey, I trust? Thank you, yes. Tell me, please, where is my sister? Has she already left for Limeridge? She has not. She is at my house. And we are going there now. We are indeed. Where is she? Tell me. I will take you to her soon. Who are those men outside? They are friends of mine. Medical men. The truth is, Lady Glyde, your sister's health has become much worse. Oh, no. The truth is, I fear for her life. Oh, do not say so. Lady Glyde. Help me. Help me. The afternoon following Lady Glyde's departure... I sat in the garden and tried to compose my mind. I sat and I gazed out across to the old, disused wing of the building. And as I gazed, I realised of a sudden that there was someone seated by one of the windows. A woman. The blood curdled in my veins. The woman, I was almost sure, was Mrs. Rubell. Mrs. Rubell? Mrs. Rubell? Yes? What is the matter? So it is you. What are you doing? 
I was told you'd gone to London along with Miss Halcombe and... Well, you were told incorrectly. I have never left the house. I don't understand. Sir Percival said quite plainly that... What of Miss Halcombe then? Oh, Miss Halcombe is making good progress. Where is she? She is here. Here? In this room. She is asleep at the moment. Come in and see her. After many adventures, I returned to England in October 1850. During my time away, I had thought constantly of Laura Fairley, she who married and took another's name, she whom I loved and would always love, though there was no hope for me. The day after my ship reached port, I visited the office of Mr. Gilmore, solicitor to the Fairley family, in order to ask if he had any news of her. Mr. Hartwright, dear Mr. Hartwright, you must prepare yourself for a shock. Why? What has happened? Laura, Lady Glyde, she is dead. Dead? She died a few months ago. I am so sorry. How did she die? Was there some accident? No, no. She became ill. A heart condition. A heart condition? When she was in London. Why was she in London? She was staying at the house of a friend of Sir Percival's, a man named Fosco, a count. Soon after arrival there, apparently, she experienced a fit of convulsions. She seemed to recover. But then, all of a sudden... I ought to advise you that Miss Halcombe came to this office shortly after her sister's death. She was emphatic that her sister had never suffered before from any problem affecting her heart. To tell the truth, she was suspicious about the entire circumstances in which Laura died. Was she indeed? On her instructions, I made some inquiries. Though it was a delicate business, as you can appreciate, I communicated with Count Fosco and found him to be most helpful and cooperative. I communicated with the Count's wife, Laura's aunt, you know, with the medical man who attended Laura, with the servants in Count Fosco's house. And? I discovered nothing. There was not the smallest fragment of detail that could lead me to share Miss Halcombe's anxiety. I can only assume that the loss of her sister had affected her judgment. Where is Miss Halcombe now? Is she at the husband's house? I have no idea where she is. But Blackwater Park, I understand, is empty. Closed. Sir Percival Glyde has gone abroad, I think. Where have they buried Laura? At Limeridge. She is laid to rest in her mother's grave. To Cumberland. The same journey I made a year ago and more. When at the instigation of my friend, Professor Pesca, I went to Limeridge House to teach drawing to two young ladies. With one of those ladies, I fell deeply in love. But now, she is dead. I have gone along the well-remembered road, looked across at the high white walls of Limeridge House and the drive, the garden, and the summer house where Laura and I first met. And finally, I have made my way down to the lonely churchyard. The air is calm and still. I walk across the sacred ground. I approach the grave with its marble cross which bears the name of Laura's mother. The cross which the woman in white all those months ago clung to in her distress. If only I would die, Mrs. Fairley, and be at rest with you. Oh, Mrs. Fairley, you know how I love your daughter. If I could save her, I would. Tell me how to save her. Tell me, please. Now on that cross is a newly cut inscription. Hard, clear, cruel letters which tell the stark story. Sacred to the memory of Laura, Lady Glyde, wife of... I turn my eyes away, refusing to read the name of that man who took her from me, who was not worthy of her. I kneel down, 
Rest my hands, my head upon the broad white stone. Close my weary eyes. Recall our last tearful words to each other when she promised that she would remember me. And I took her hand and kissed it. Oh, Laura. Laura, come back to me. Let my heart speak to yours. Laura, my love. Footsteps. Two women in the cold clearness of the slanting light. Two veiled women who are walking in my direction. They see me. They stop. One of them lifts her veil. Marion. Marion Halcombe. It is her face, though it has changed, as if many years have passed over it. Her eyes are large and wild, terrified. The other woman, still veiled, comes nearer. The shuddering of an unutterable dread creeps over me from head to foot. Walter Hartwright. Walter Hartwright. She has possession of me, body and soul. Oh, Lord God, strengthen him. Help him in his hour of need. She approaches. As she moves, her shadow falls upon the grave and then rises up. The tombstone stands between us. The cross, sacred to the memory of Laura, Lady Glyde. She lifts the veil. It is I. <sighs> Laura! Laura! That was episode three of The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins, dramatised for radio by Martin Wade. Marion was played by Juliet Aubrey, Laura by Emily Bruni, Count Fosco by Philip Voss, Sir Percival by Jeremy Clyde, Walter by Toby Stevens, and Mr Fairley by Edward Petherbridge. Madame Fosco was Geraldine Fitzgerald, Anne Catherick, Alice Hart, Mr Gilmore, Sean Baker, Mrs. Mitchelson, Carolyn Pickles, Mr. Dawson, Jonathan Keeble, and Mrs. Rubel, Richenda Carey. The music was specially composed by Elizabeth Parker. The director was Cherry Cookson. Mm -hmm.